Hi friends, it's Gwen. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here to share my best and worst books of 2023. So all of these books I read in the year of 2023, not necessarily published in 2023. That's how I've always done it. That's how I will continue to do it. And if you subscribe to my podcast, follow my podcast, you already know my top five best and worst. So definitely click the link in the description box to follow along on my podcast journey. I have so many fun things planned in the new year, but today you're here to find out what were the crappy books that you read and what were the favorite books that you read? And I'm here to tell you. So we're going to start with the worst and we're going to move on to the best. Now, some of my worst books, I still have copies of some I've already ditched to them. So I will pop in a picture for you. Okay. So I always like to start at number 10, which is like the worst to number one, which is like terrible, the worst of the worst, if that makes sense. So Starting off at number 10 on my worst list is Haven by Emma Donahue. This is the only book on my worst list that got two stars rather than one star. That means that I had nine one star reads this year, which made this list very easy to curate. So Haven, I actually read for my podcast with my friend Lena from Lena's Bookshelf. And this was so historical. It was the furthest back in history possible. Not only did I not like the characters, I didn't like the descriptions. I didn't like the writing. I didn't like the setting. I didn't like the plot. There was really almost nothing about this book that I liked. Um, I have a full podcast discussion on this book, but you have these monks that go to this island three men that vow to leave the world behind. They set out in a small boat for an extraordinary island their leader has seen in a dream with only faith to guide them. I feel like I know it's the point of like believing in your faith, but at the same time, there were so many bad mistakes and these monks were treated so poorly by their leader and they were trying to make this situation livable, but he was just like, no, I saw it in a dream and this is how it has to be. There was also a lot of like eating of birds and using their blood for ink and just a whole bunch of stuff that I just didn't really like. Um, so I ended up giving this one two stars. I do love this cover though. I think it's very pretty, but this story was definitely not for me. And it really wasn't for Lena either, if we're being honest. Okay, coming in at number nine is Good Bad Girl by Alice Feeney. I did not like this book. I was totally bored the entire time I was reading it. It was not a thriller. It was not suspenseful. It's basically about several different women and how their lives intersect. And unfortunately, the synopsis tells you that, that all of these women's stories interconnect. So I really didn't like that it told you, like in the synopsis, that these things were going to happen. Um, it was just very slow moving. And if you read a lot of thrillers or a lot of these type of like interconnected stories, you could kind of see like what was going on and how they were connected. So I wasn't shocked by anything. I also have a reading vlog of me reading this book. I read it during the Sleep When I'm Dead readathon and I have all of my thoughts in that video if you're interested. But I was just so terribly bored and really let down by Alice Feeney. I think Alice Feeney is one of those authors I'm always intrigued by, but I don't actually end up loving her books. So maybe that's an author that I should give up in 2024. In the eighth spot is another historical fiction book, The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. I did not like this book. I never planned on reading this book, but this is one of my friend Keisha's from A Book Like You. It was one of her favorite books. She had fond memories of this book. It's short and it has letters, like it's an epistolary novel, which I do love, uh, but it was so plotless. The first half of the book before she actually gets to the island of Guernsey was very dull. I didn't understand the point. When she got to Guernsey and there was the found family aspect, I did like it slightly more, but I only read it because we were buddy reading it. I would have DNF'd so many times. Well, I wouldn't even have picked it up, but yeah, I read it, didn't like it. At least I gave it a go. 
In the number seventh spot is Big Swiss by Jen Begin, and I got this from the Aardvark Book Club. I was totally intrigued by this weird cover, and I wanted to find a new favorite that I could recommend to people, and unfortunately, this is just one of those weird kind of like slice of life story kind of plotless more of like a character study type book I really can't even tell you too much about what this book is about because I think I've blocked out all memories of the book um but the cover is weird the inside is weird I do know it's about this woman that gets this like old ranch house and there's like this beehive in her kitchen and she like doesn't get rid of it and it keeps getting like bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I think there's a guy above a coffee shop. I don't know what. Oh, there's a psychiatrist's office above the coffee shop and she runs into people that are also like go to the psychiatrist or something like that. I don't know. It's really weird. I would not recommend it. Moving on. Okay, next up is Acts of Desperation by Megan Noland. I heard great things about this in 2022, so I put it on my 23 books I wanted to read in 2023. And it has a lot to do with like relationships and physical and mental abuse, but I was so terribly bored. If you're going to talk about abuse in any form, about death and dying in any form, and I don't feel empathetic or sympathetic, like you've done something wrong. Um, and yeah, it just did not work for me. I think the cover is also very intriguing. And that's another reason why I really wanted to read it. But I just did not vibe with this one. The writing did not feel polished enough to me. And it also was just so confusing. It kind of reminded me a little bit the writing of Mona Awad, if I'm remembering correctly. But I wasn't vibing with it. All right. Now we're getting into my top five worst books. In the fifth position is Stay True by Washu. This is a memoir of this young Asian American's life while he is in college. And it's also a little bit of a tribute to his friend Ken who died while they were in college. Unfortunately, back to what I was saying about like death and dying. And if you don't make me feel empathetic or sympathetic, I really did not. And his relation, I really went into it hoping for good things. I picked this for my Night Owl book club, which is my Patreon book club. If you're interested in joining, check the link in the description, but back to the book. Um, so we picked this and we read it and we had a discussion and I don't really remember anybody saying like, wow, new favorite or really enjoying it at all. None of us could understand the connection that he had with Ken. And like, he didn't even seem like he was sad about Ken's death. Like, we didn't feel that. We didn't feel like we got to know Ken. It was so self-centered. And he didn't appreciate the things that he had. Like, the relationship with his dad was literally, like, so wholesome. But he just did not appreciate it at all. And I thought, like, okay, I'll go into it for the 90s vibes. The 90s vibes were also not working. It also had some multimedia, like, pictures and stuff like that mixed in the book. But none of the pictures related to the story at all. And I just don't even understand how this was, like, one of the best memoirs of 2022, according to NPR and other sources as well. But I just... I don't think, maybe it's like the Asian representation, like maybe I just didn't connect or understand the connection, but I also just don't think that the author made it clear. So it's really just his slice of life story about his time in college and things that happened to him and what was going on in his head at that time. So I do not recommend this if you're looking for memoir suggestions. In the number four spot is The Fortunate Ones by Ed Tarkington. And this, I thought I was going in for a dark academia book. And it is about this boy that gets connected with this other boy. Like, it's like a big, like, there's a student that's new to the school and he's set up with this other student so they can like show him around the school and stuff like that. And they kind of become friends and the new boy, the new student is like from a lower in 
outcome class like type situation. And the school that he's going to is like this posh elite vibe school. But again, it's not really about that. It's really a boy's coming of age story. And I need to stop with reading the boys' stories because I just don't vibe with them at all. Um, like this being a really good example, like maybe I'm just not on that level. Maybe, you know, someone that identifies as a male will enjoy these stories, but I just did not. I also didn't like that it had like, it was pretty linear, but then it would like jump a month and then it would jump like 10 years and then it would jump, like it just jumped around a lot and it wasn't uniform in its delivery. And I just, I don't like boys coming of ages stories. So that's all I have to say about that. In the third spot is the London Seance Society by Sarah Penner. I originally got it from Book of the Month because I heard such great things about the Lost Apothecary. Unfortunately, this one did not live up to all the hype of the Lost Apothecary. Um, I ended up like even unhauling my Book of the Month copy and getting this beautiful one from Barnes & Noble um, because it was for my in-person book club that we read this. And... I was so excited because I had joined an in-person book club and I was very excited to read it. So we chose this for the May pick and we actually had our first meeting in June and none of us liked the book. It did not, it had like, I was expecting, I went in expecting these like women that are solving these cold cases by doing this like underground dark London sleuthing and they were going to do seances and, you know, to find out stuff, but it was not that. It was so immature. Everything was so not even predictable, but everything was so obvious and the writing was just so immature. There was like one whole seance in here and it was during the explanation of the whodunit. So you didn't even really get the vibes of the seance. I just really did not like this book. The other ladies that we talked about, that I talked about in book club, did also not like this book, which is a shame because the cover is so pretty but it just wasn't what the synopsis promised. And had I known that it was going to be like, it's set in like 1870s London, but I couldn't even like picture any of the scenes, any of the characters, anything that was going on because like the description was lacking, but also it was so descriptive at the same time. And I just remember being so bored. I only pushed through because of my book club. Okay guys, <laughs> these next two are heavy hitters. Don't hate me, but in the number two spot is another book club pick, and that is Rouge by Mona Awad. This is the third book I've read by this author, and I just cannot, for the life of me, get into her writing. They are such weird books. There's so much symbolism and read between the lines and in inferences and... I like reading books that I am to digest the words on the page. She wants you to take the words on the page and then think about all those words and what it symbolizes and then create the story in your head. I'm not that type of reader. I have only slightly, slightly enjoyed, and I think I gave it like two or three stars, 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl. I didn't like Bunny. I did not like this one. It's about a woman that her mother has died. She didn't have a great relationship with her mom, but her mom was obsessed with skin care. She's obsessed with skin care. It's about the whole beauty industry and all of that. She's also obsessed with Tom Cruise, but I really honestly cannot tell you much about it because I just don't understand it. Like I really, really don't. But if you're looking for a weird book, definitely pick it up. Um, it has a lot to do with this like house that she goes to that's kind of like this kind of cult, like beauty guru cult. Like they're trying to make you look younger and I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. It just, it was not it. So what do you think my worst book of 2023 is? I'll give you a second. Take your guess in the comments. The worst book that I read in 2023 was Black Sheep by Rachel Harrison. 
And this one really hurts because I have enjoyed so many of Rachel Harrison's books and I thought she was one of my favorite horror authors, but this one has me double thinking that. My favorite by her is Such Sharp Teeth. Uh, I also liked Cackle, The Returned. I liked part of it. I didn't really like like the monster aspect of it. This one, the synopsis is very vague. You have a character that has like had this religious upbringing that she did not agree with. And I think that the story relies on the shock value and this big reveal. And then once you have that, you're either gonna love it or you're gonna hate it. I hated it. And obviously, <laughs> And I wish that in the synopsis or somewhere in the promotion of this book, it would have told you more. A lot of readers won't even pick up this book if they knew what it was. That's kind of like the case with me. But despite that, despite not liking like the re despite not liking the reveal, I still didn't feel like Harrison's signature cozy, humorous vibe. And it was just kind of plotless, like nothing happened. I was like sure that there was going to be like some type of a twist or something that I was like not getting. And so I pushed through and nothing happened. It was just that one thing. And I was like, oh, that sucks. So it was definitely the worst book. And I think if the marketing was done better, I wouldn't have even picked it up. I don't even like the cover. I do like the pink and I like that, but I don't like this. Anyway, that is my worst books that I read this year. I have heard that Rachel Harrison is doing a vampire book next year and I'm slightly intrigued, but also slightly nervous. So I don't know. Anyway, another sip of my coffee and then we will jump into the best books that I read in 2023, which is what I'm really excited for. Okay, it's time for my favorite books that I read in 2023. And if you don't know, I do seasonal favorites. Every three months, I do a video encapsulating my five-star reads of those three months of that season. So all of these books I have talked to you guys about. So there's no surprises here. So if you think you know any of my top books, before you watch this part, leave a comment down below. And let's see if you're right. And also, if you don't know my favorite book of the year yet, I have failed you. I have absolutely failed you. Actually, if you don't know my top two, I've failed. But I'm going to tell you all of them today. Again, we're going to go with the same format. We're going to go from number 10, which is a favorite, to number one, which is my favorite favorite. Okay? Starting out at number 10, we have Last Night at the Lobster by Stuart O'Man. I loved this little book so much and I think it's such a unique book to me. Like, I don't think you're going to read it and it's going to be in your top 10 favorites of the year. I just don't. But for me, for where I was in my reading journey when I read this, I absolutely loved it. It follows a manager of a Red Lobster that is closing. It is the last night of the restaurant being opened. There's a snowstorm. It's near Christmas and you're just following the manager and the employees on the last night. That's literally the story. And it was so spot on, not only to like the restaurant business and the employees that kind of like work in the restaurant industry, but I also just loved it. It was like one night, the last night, and it was just so, I don't know, it brought me back to my days of working in a restaurant and I absolutely loved that. So I loved it. Um, it's short. I loved the writing and I can't wait to read more by this author. In the ninth spot, total shocker, this book was not on my radar until Elizabeth from Reading Riley asked me and my friends to join her for a book discussion. We read The Odds by Jeff Strand. And this is in the number ninth spot because I 
it was one of those like popcorn horror books. Like I just kept like, it was like a train wreck, like that you just can't look away from. It's about this guy that's lost a lot of money. He has a gambling addiction and he's like upset at himself for losing all of this money and he gets a chance to win back the money. And it's kind of like these games where the odds of the game keep changing, but the games keep getting like worse and worse and worse. And it wasn't until, I mean, is it a little bit ridiculous? Absolutely. Like, is this going to happen in the real world? Absolutely not. Um, but if you go in and you're okay with it being a little bit ridiculous, um, maybe a lot ridiculous, um, I think you would really enjoy it. And it's the ending though, that I was like, screaming, crying, throwing up. Ah, it was so entertaining. And I think above anything else, above a literary masterpiece, give me a book that will entertain me and it's going to be a favorite. So I absolutely loved this. And if any of that sounds good to you, definitely pick it up. But I do have that full book discussion with the other lady, so I will try to remember to link that down below for you. Okay, coming in at number eight is one that I knew was going to be in my favorites at the end of the year, and here it is, The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. Look, Keisha, it made it into my favorites just like I knew it would. I have looked long and hard like online, in bookstores, used bookstores for this book. I I just could never find it. And then finally, Keisha sent it to me for Christmas one year. I think it was Christmas or my birthday. Yes, it was Christmas. And I am so grateful because I absolutely loved this. This is a nonfiction collection of essays by John Green. And I love nonfiction, but it has to be like a certain type of nonfiction. And this is all surrounding like different things in our world, on earth, um, from climate change to QWERTY keyboards, to uh, migration patterns, to air conditioning, all these like random things. And he did a study of that and kind of talked about like, how this fell on the rating scale. The Anthropocene is the current geological age in which humans have profoundly reshaped the planet and its biodiversity. And this remarkable symphony of essays adapted and expanded from his groundbreaking podcast, best-selling author John Green reviews different facets of the human-centered planet on a five-star scale. So, I highly recommend it. Not only did I think that the essays were interesting and informative, but it had John Green's classic storytelling style. I didn't feel like, oh, I'm sitting down to read a nonfiction. Like, it was so interesting and I learned so much. And not only about the things that he was talking about, but he also weaved in his own stories and how these things related to his life. And it was just so interesting. So it kind of felt like part memoir, part essays, but more essays. So anyway, I loved this one. I love the cover and I'm so happy that I read it. All right, coming in at number seven is Abby Jimenez. I read all of her books except for Part of Your World. I read Part of Your World last year. It was my favorite book of 2022. And this year I read all of her other books. So I read the follow-up to Part of Your World, Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez. And I also read the Friend Zone trilogy. The Friend Zone, I actually rated four stars, but these two I rated five stars, The Happy Ever After Playlist and Life's Too Short. Um, I highly recommend all of her books. They're all like, you know, as a series, it's five stars. Um, I only took off one star because there were a few things that were like totally unbelievable type of things in the friend zone, but um, I loved this one. I loved the male main character. He's a musician and the end scene is just so cute. And then in this one, it kind of deals with like these neighbors, they're like apartments they live in apartments and their neighbors and he like helps her out. I don't know. Her characters are just, her stories are so real. Like they're realistic, but they also deal with heavy topics. But this one though, oh, Jacob is just like this little cinnamon roll that you just want to protect with your whole heart. And I just, 
I love it. I also like that her books are dual POV, so you get to see what's happening in both characters' heads. Um, I just love everything she writes. I can't wait for her new book to come out in 2024. Um, I just have to give the spot to her for all of her books. But these were the ones that I rated five stars. And can you believe I actually read these books this year? Like, I feel like I read these so long ago. Moving on to number six is The Quiet Tenant by Clemence McCallan. And this is the only thriller that I have on this list, which is shocking um, because thrillers are my favorite. But this one just really stood out to me. It's written by a Parisian author and she wrote in English for the very first time. And it was just so, like if you like Notes on an Execution, I think you would like this one too. They're very different, but also similar because instead of looking at the serial killer, the bad guy, you're looking at the women in his life. So in this one you follow the woman that he has kidnapped, you follow his girlfriend and you follow his daughter and you kind of see his life through their eyes. And it just kept me on the edge of my seat. I was totally engaged. I loved the characters. I loved the character study. The plot was great. It was well paced. Um, but the story really, it begins when she, he has already kidnapped someone and he has been holding them in this like storage area near his, in his house. Um, but for events that happen, he has to move. Like him and his daughter have to move to a new house at a new location and he's going down into the basement or storage area to take her out. But she, you know, talks him out of it and says, take me with you, I'll do whatever you say, blah, 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 blah. So he takes her to the new house. And when they get to the new house, he has to keep her in a room in the actual house. And things just change from there because the situation has changed and his daughter, he obviously lives with his daughter. So like the daughter is possibly gonna see her. And I don't know, it's just, it's so interesting and seeing these women come together and like fight just, oh, gives me so much joy. So anyway, I absolutely loved this. And if you love thrillers that have like a unique writing style, um, a unique pace, like I really, really loved this one. The next three books are all romance books that I absolutely loved this year. Coming in at number five is The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston. I adore this book so much for so many reasons. As you can see, I did annotate and highlight in here. Uh, this is about um, Clementine who moves into her aunt's apartment after she dies and she sees that there's someone already living there. But he's, he's actually, when she walks into the apartment, it's actually seven years in the past. And the aunt has like let him have the apartment or whatever like that for like the summer. And so it's very interesting because not only do you get a taste of the relationship between the aunt and Clementine, but you also see her and this man from seven years in the past falling in love over the course of the story. And it has that magical realism, obviously, element into it. It also has like a baking element into it. It has lemon pie in it. So I highly recommend you have some on hand, but it just has a lot about like life and love and memories and it's just so sweet and so good. I actually enjoyed this more than I liked the dead romantics and that's saying something. Coming in at number four is a book I read in December. Literally read this in December and absolutely fell in love with it. Love Redesigned by Lauren Asher. Oh my gosh, I am so happy I picked up this book. I was at the bookstore and something was just calling to me to pick up this book. I also do want to talk about it and recommend it in an upcoming episode on my podcast in the springtime on um, books with reno vibes, like HDTV renovation vibes. And this was one of the books that was like on my radar to read. And I'm so glad I picked it up when I did. It's a chunky book. I flew through it. I absolutely loved it, obviously. Um, but I love the cover. It also has a playlist, a content warning page, a map. It has a great dedication. It also has chapter headers. It's dual POV. 
And at the bottom, it has footnotes of all of the Spanish terms used throughout the story defined for you. I loved it so much. So you have these childhood, family, friends, to enemies, to lovers, to like, they're working together to restore this Victorian home. And it's just, it is spicy. It is spicy. Um, but I just fell in love not only with the couple and the characters, but their family and their friends and the town. And it's just like, oh my gosh. But you have our main character, Dahlia, who has just been kind of like dumped. And she's been kind of like, uh, she broke off her engagement. And so she went back to the small town where, um, where Julian lives. And he is a billionaire. And they decide to renovate this Victorian home together to hopefully get Dahlia's like spark back, creative spark. And there's more sparks flying than you will know what to do with. Ah, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Cannot wait for new books to come out in this series. I actually need to go back and finish up the fine print uh, trilogy. I forget what it's called. The Dreamland Billionaires. I need to go finish up the Dreamland Billionaires. I have books too. I have the second book. I need to get the third book. I need to read those because those characters do pop up in this. Not like important to the plot or anything. Like you don't have to read them, but because they're in here, like I definitely want to read it now. But this is the Lakefront Billionaires and the other one is the Dreamland Billionaires. But <laughs> this book, y'all, I didn't really love fine print like this. This is, <sighs> I love it so much. Oh my gosh. <sighs> anyway, so good. All right, coming in at number three is When in Rome by Sarah Adams. And if you guys saw the live show where I was doing reading sprints, I was gabbing about this book so much. I was smiling ear to ear. I was like laughing. I was giggling. I just, this book was so sweet. It's a small town romance between a pop star and a baker and I loved the town I loved the characters I loved the pacing it's short it's sweet it's wholesome um but basically you have this pop star that's kind of like burnt out and she decides to follow in the footsteps of her favorite actress Audrey Hepburn and she goes she like takes off to Rome Rome Kentucky and when she gets there she breaks down in Noah's like front yard and he offers her to stay in his guest room until she's able to get her car looked at they fall in love it's wonderful it's great and uh, any man that gets his muscles from baking pies you know he's a winner love this one all right the last two are what i would classify as general fiction books and that's something that I've been reading a lot of. And I don't know if that's what's gonna, what my reading's gonna look like in 2024, but I'm glad it looks like this in 2023. Um, okay, the number two spot goes to The Collected Regrets of Clover by Miki Bramer. I am so excited that I read this book. When it was originally a book of the month pick, I skipped. I got mine from book the book exchange and I'm so happy that I did because I was just hearing such great things and I started getting a little intrigued. I cannot recommend this book enough. I think that this would work for a lot of people because it has a lot going on. Not a lot going on as in like too much going on, but I think it has themes and topics that will work for a lot of readers, but it follows a death doula. And so Clover, when she was in kindergarten, her kindergarten teacher was reading Peter Rabbit and Drop Dead. And ever since then, she's just been obsessed with death. And then she ended up becoming a death doula. She lives in New York City and her deceased grandfather's apartment. He basically raised her because her parents died when she was younger. Um, so her teacher, then her parents. So then she had to go live with her grandfather in New York City. And now she's surrounded by all of his things and she's, you know, going to people's houses, helping them, you know, like that end of life care type thing. So I learned a lot about what a death doula was, about death cafes, uh, but I learned also a lot about treasuring life. 
through the perspective of a death doula. And she keeps these little notebooks and writes down stories and memories and quotes and, you know, stuff about the people that she takes care of. And it's also about her taking care of herself and kind of just dealing with the emotional baggage of, you know, all of the things. And I just loved it so much. And I wasn't expecting it. It's also very emotional, as you can imagine. It does have like a slight romance element in it, but it's not. It's not a romance. It's not a romance. So don't go into it expecting that. But I just really loved everything about it. Like I cannot recommend this book. This is not only like my second favorite book of the year. It's a new all-time favorite book. This will be the first book that I read in 2024 because I always reread a favorite and this is the book I'm going to read. So if you're wondering what I'm reading on New Year's Day, this is the book. I cannot wait because I want to annotate it. I want to highlight all the beautiful quotes that I found throughout my reading experience. I was just soaking it up so fast that I didn't even have time to pull out a highlighter or like a tab, but believe you me, I am going to be doing that in 2024. Okay. And my favorite book of the year, I've talked about this so much, people may have forgotten about this book because I'm talking about Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zivin. It is wild to me that I just read this book in May. Like I just read this book in May, not once, but twice. Because when I finished reading this book, I was just sitting at my desk absolutely in awe of like, everything that I read, I felt the wind taken out of me. Like I was breathless. I was, I don't even know. I was like, my whole life just changed. I could not think or act or do anything until I reread it. It wasn't until I reread it that I was finally able to go like, okay, now I can get on with my life because I had to kind of almost get the story out of me because I was just living with these characters. So <laughs> if you don't know what this book is about by now, it follows these characters, Sam and Sadie, from when they're young over many years of their life. So they met when they were much younger, like 10, 11, 12, something like that. And then they went to college together. They're game designers. They end up working together to design these games. And it's about their friendship and about their working together and about their lives and how their lives change and grow. And it is just, it's something special. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Also, if you're looking for a happy book, this is not it. It's full of sadness from beginning to end. It's just kind of like, missed opportunities and life, but it's just so well written. And it's more of a character driven story than it is a plot driven story, but it still does also have a very good plot. And it's just a slice of life story of these two characters. And <laughs> I don't know, it's just so good. But don't expect like, fantastical things. Don't expect a love story. Don't ex just expect to really get to know Sam and Sadie and their friendship. That's really what the story is. And bonus points if you like video games. That's basically it. But that is my favorite book of 2023. It is now my all-time favorite book of all time, I can't stop thinking about it. I had a really hard time deciding between these two. Um, I have three copies of this book now. I have this one, which was, this is also a book that I skipped when it was a book of the month choice. I didn't get my copy until it was selected as book of the year. And I know this is a very popular book. It has a very high average rating. It won the Goodreads Fiction for 2022. It won the book of the year for book of the month last year. But this book is so good, you guys, so good. So, um, but I have this copy. I have one from Berlin. And then I have the one that I shared at my latest book haul that Keisha got me that has like the beautiful ombre sprayed edges. But I think if I annotate any of them, 
I almost want to get another copy of the book, like another non-book of the month copy of the book and annotate that. So that is kind of what I need to do before I go back and reread this and annotate it. Um, oh my gosh, I love this book so much. So that's my favorite book. I will be rereading this. These are new all-time favorites. These are now all-time favorites. Uh, this one is an all-time fave. Like all of these books are so, so, so good. But that wraps up my 2023 reading year. I cannot wait for 2024. I'm so excited and I hope you are too. So thank you guys so much for watching. I love all of you all. I love these books. Um, yeah, so I hope you're having a lovely day or night and I'll see you guys again in another video very soon. Bye friends.